So today's webinar is Enriching the CLSA with Environmental Exposure Data, the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Resource Consortium. Let me introduce our speakers. Jeffrey Brook is the Principal Investigator and Scientist Director of CANOE and has 25 years of experience as an Environment Canada scientist working at the Science Policy Interface. During this time, he has spent 15 years as faculty at the University of Toronto, where he was involved in research, lecturing, and graduate research training. He is one of Canada's leading experts in air quality, recognized at all levels of government and academically, including for his substantial contributions in air pollution health research. Dr. Brook has led scientific assessments to inform policy nationally and internationally and advised multi-stakeholder groups shaping policy. He has led a variety of multidisciplinary research teams in government, government academic partnerships, and in academia. Recently, his efforts have expanded beyond air quality. For example, for eight years now, he has led the Environmental Working Group of the Canadian Health Infant Longitudinal Development, or CHILD study, and co-led the Gene Times Environment Research Platform within the Alder Gene Network of Centers of Excellence. Eleanor Sutton is the Managing Director of CANOE. As an adjunct associate professor, Eleanor most recently acted as co-director of the Spatial Sciences Research Laboratory at the University of Victoria. This role involved managing the SSRL grants, staff, and students, and conducting a range of research related to spatial aspects of exposure to environmental pollutants, as PI or COI. Of particular value to CANOE is Dr. Sutton's experience in population-level environmental exposure assessment, direct experience working with large spatial and tabular data sets related to land use, pollutant emissions, and socioeconomic characteristics, and developing knowledge and pollution products about cancer in the environment. Danny Dwaran is based at Maelstrom Research Group at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center in Montreal. Danny has worked with a number of epidemiological research consortia in Canada and Europe, helping them implement innovative solutions to facilitate multi-centered data integration and co-analysis, and provides expertise on linking environmental data to confidential health databases for CANOE. So welcome all to our presenters, and now I will hand over presentation to Dr. Brooks to begin our webinar. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, Carol, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you to everybody on the line who's joined. I'm really excited to tell you about CANOE, the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. Uh, myself, I'm based at the Dalana School of Public Health uh, at the University of Toronto and the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I'm, so I'm sitting here in Toronto uh, and hope that you'll find this webinar to be uh, informative. I'm going to provide an overview of, of CANOE and urban environmental health research to begin with and why it's important in Canada. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Danny Duaral and Eleanor Sutton eventually to continue to provide more details and then hopefully we'll have a good discussion at the end. So there you go, there's me, based in Toronto. Um, yes, we are called the Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, and uh, you will uh, see in this diagram uh, a large number of, of interacting environmental factors. Some of them can impact our health positively, others can impact our health negatively, uh, and it's really, important that we start to think about these in a more holistic manner. Uh, in this diagram, uh, which we sort of use to guide how we bring things together in canoe, you can see across the bottom uh, a large number of important factors that influence our, our urban, suburban, even rural areas, from population growth and economic growth to, to weather and climate, which can be responded to uh, through land use planning, transportation planning, uh, and then lead to in this case, how a city like Ottawa is laid out or could be laid out in the future. At the same time, there is the populations that live in those areas across the top and um, how old they are, um, what their various susceptibilities are, capacities are, uh, how they behave in terms of their, their movement throughout the city. That sort of leads to population distribution that varies across space and time. And, uh, and that then puts them into the situation where they have differential exposures to a variety of environmental factors like, like air pollution, uh, access to healthy foods, green space, parks, ability for uh, physical activity, whether it be recreational or uh, 
for a uh, purpose of getting to and from work and so on. And these all interact together. Ultimately, we, we all, I think, believe to be very important determinants of our health. There's been a variety of studies over many years that have looked at these factors in Canada. I think uh, um, it's probably at least 20 years ago uh, you know, that we looked at uh, air pollution mixtures and found that they were leading to an increased risk of dying when the levels were high, especially when mixtures of multiple pollutants were high. Also, you know, a number of years ago, looking not at sort of the, the end of life, but the start of life, clear associations between air pollutants and adverse birth outcomes uh, in Vancouver, which in terms of the pollution world, one would think of as being quite a clean city. But uh, that's the air pollution world. And one of the big questions in the air pollution world has always been particulate matter, fine particulate matter, which is used quite a bit as a, as a real indicator of, of dirty air. Uh, but not all particulate matter is created equal. And so more recent research that's been done in Canada and worldwide has tried to look at you know, what features, what chemical components, what sources of particulate matter are having a greater impact on health. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's some more recent work in this area. And um, these are all studies that are now working uh, with data or have helped generate data that's available in canoe. Moving to another important issue within urban areas would be urban greenness, which has a variety of ways in which it may impact our health, whether it be through um, an area for exercise, uh, an area for peace and quiet, an area for uh, reducing air pollution. Uh, they're all perceived to be quite good benefits and at this stage within canoe, we're housing the, this normalized difference vegetation index, NVDI, which is derived from a satellite for use in a variety of epidemiologic studies. Um, I mentioned exercise in terms of greenness, and um, we have, uh, and others in the field for many years have been quantifying factors such as walkability uh, and whether that uh, it might entice people to get out of their cars and walk or bike more. And there are ways to quantify this using GIS data. And there's been great research done in, in Ontario and in Canada uh, that's been looking at whether or not these features of our urban form indeed not only lead to more slight amounts of exercise increases, but to health outcomes, beneficial health outcomes. And this one study, this is a recent uh, piece of work, you know, presented to us findings around uh, metabolic risk factors, uh, blood pressure um, indicators uh, in the blood of, uh, in, of, of improved health in areas where it was more walkable. And interestingly though, if you look here in a European study, the PLUS One paper, uh, what you know, they're showing there, it's, it's really important to consider climate and day length and other features of, of the environment in terms of how they interact with uh, people's ability to get out and enjoy walkable spaces. Uh, very complex aspects of, of features of our urban form. Another area that we have been bringing into the, the canoe data set because of its importance has been things related to extreme weather and climate. And here's a couple examples where uh, researchers have been looking at heat waves uh, and particularly heat waves and the impacts on uh, gender and age and seemingly pointing towards greater risk of, of heat wave related mortalities uh, among females, uh, elderly females in particular. And uh, these, are, these are data sets that we're acquiring and bringing into canoe to make available for a variety of research questions. So it's, I think, uh, important to sort of realize that, that you know, we live in these, these spaces, these places, um, People have different experiences around them depending on where they live. Uh, and they, they have subtle chronic effects that can impact many different health outcomes at all different stages of life. Uh, but sometimes to see these effects, they require very large populations to be able to get the size of the power you want for the study. Uh, and, and even more importantly, in, in, in it, being able to look at multiple factors at the same time, it's really critical to have 
large, well-characterized populations to study the interactions that I, I showed in that earlier slide. And you know, to date, many of the studies like from the ones I showed really has tended to focus on what's their issue, their question of interest, and looking at maybe one or two co-exposures. We do know that they're interacting together, and that's an area where we hope by, by, by serving as a platform for multiple different types of quantifiable exposure metrics, we can advance the science to look at interactions. And a value we see in CANOE is, is that a lot of those studies will have a data set, they'll have an environmental question, they'll generate the exposure data that they want to have for that time window that they've got a, a population they're following, uh, and then the study's done and that's it. They may you know, follow up with more research, but uh, we see that there's a need to get those types of exposure metrics out there for more use instead of people reinventing the wheel each time for a new study. And that, that will lead again for us to ask these more difficult questions down the road. Um, now, what's really enabled Canoe was a whole series of meetings, workshops that CIHR held back um, now over five years ago to start with. There was an interest growing within CIHR and a number of the institutes to, to really address environment and health in a systematic way and build on Canadian strengths. And so in 2011, they had a workshop focusing on environmental exposures, uh, followed up in 2012 with a, a national workshop on environment genes and chronic disease, uh, and then ultimately in 2013 with uh, an environmental health national forum, bringing together many environmental health researchers across the country with a huge variety of perspectives. But some of the key factors that uh, they sort of came out of this with CIHR was that there really was still a need to break down the existing silos of research in the environment health field, get there to be more interdisciplinary collaborations happening. That it, the world is very complex and we need to come tackle that complexity head on. We also hear that from our policymakers today that you know they understand it's complex and, and single risk factor studies don't inform as much as they'd like to be able to get from looking at all the interactions. Uh, and we know that, that, that you know, the environment is, is ubiquitous around us. There's also was perceived to be a, a need to build more research capacity in Canada and to have supporting data platforms. So that's where Canoe comes in. Uh, CIHR did uh, uh, announce uh, uh, an open call to form a consortium to enrich health research data platforms by building an environmental data research platform. Uh, and Canoe ourselves, we were uh, successful in this call and started in June 2016. So we're just a little over two years old now. Uh, we've been working closely with a number of cohorts and environmental researchers. Uh, and uh, from that time till 2021, we've got about $4.2 million to put to this cause. Now to sort of move canoe from an idea to something in practice, you can see here a flow diagram that describes uh, how we're structured. Um, really much of the work is happening on the right-hand side amongst the data teams. So you can see the sort of different areas that we've brought in expertise across different universities in Canada from air quality and weather and climate to a range of neighborhood factors that, that move over into socioeconomic issues uh, and are not purely just physical features, uh, down to transportation, which is a, a key element of what shapes our cities and shapes many of our behaviors as well. Uh, they're supported by uh, a, a sort of conglomeration of various experts who are expressing an interest in CANOE. Um, I do point out that one of our areas is sort of integrated research around adults. Uh, and that's where uh, we sort of have sort of slated some input from CLSA into, into Canoe as needed. Um, the, the directors uh, that lead Canoe are myself as a PI. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Michael Brower at UBC, Kim McGrail at UBC, Philip Awadala uh, here at Dalana School of Public Health, Howard Hu, formerly at Dalana School of Public Health, uh, PJ Subarau at Sick Kids Hospital leading the child cohort, and Dave Steve with Health Canada, uh, a knowledge translation expert. So uh, I pointed out the groups uh, of our exposures and the data teams, here they are again. Uh, a key goal that we have is to really you know, pull together the existing information that is known and can be resolved spatially to assign to people based on uh, 
their, their address or a six digit postal code. And again, across a variety of factors and to make these data truly analysis ready uh, for researchers to access and use. And one of the really critical ways that, that we feel that we can make these data analysis ready is to actually link them to a variety of health data sets right up front so that they're there for request uh, and analysis and a whole variety of questions. So they're not, it's not an independent data set. While well, we do house with an independent data set, but we've really targeted groups like CLSA to push data into the cohort and to be linked. Uh, and so that's uh, where we stand this stage. I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, Danny Duaron, um, who will tell us a little more details about what we've done, how we've linked data to, to CLSA, what the data are looking like. Uh, and so I'll pass it over to Danny for continuation. Thank you very much. So, Danny, are you there? Good. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So thanks, Jeff, and, and thanks everyone for, for being there. Um, uh, my name is Danny Duaron, and I'm located at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center in Montreal. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, with its staff specialist members and leaders, uh, CANOE is establishing a common platform of national and regional level geospatial data appropriate for epidemiological research. So over the past couple years, CANOE has worked hard on developing health relevant metrics in the domains of transportation, neighborhood factors, noise pollution, air quality, greenness, and climate and weather. And in my section of this webinar, I'll give you an overview of the environmental exposure data sets that are now pre-linked to CLSA baseline data and ready to be used for research projects. Many of the data sets I'll be presenting today have actually already been accessed through CLSA's regular data access procedures by investigators from across Canada. Now, before I dive into the data overview, I just want to quickly mention that all environmental exposures held and distributed by CANOE are indexed to the six-digit postal code. So the six-digit postal code acts as a unique link between CANOE area-level exposure data sets and the health data held by cohorts such as the CLSA. So for the CLSA, data sets are merged using the residential address postal code at baseline assessment. And we also plan to link uh, environmental exposures with CLSA follow-up data in the future. So CLSA currently has three pre-linked data sets of neighborhood factors available to researchers. First, the Material and Social Deprivation Index developed at the Institut National de Santé Publique du Québec, or INSPQ, is a publicly available data set based on small area units from Canadian census data. This data has already been used extensively in public health research and includes metrics that describe geographic variations in material and social deprivation. The 2011 deprivation indices were linked to the CLSA baseline data and are provided as raw scores and quintiles based on region, province, and for all of Canada. The map here on the slide shows material deprivation scores as quintiles for Victoria, British Columbia. Green uh, shows areas of low material deprivation and red shows areas of uh, high material deprivation. Each dot on this map and in, on su subsequent maps represents uh, one postal code. And the uh, light pink lines that you see on the map are uh, the dissemination area boundaries for reference. The Canadian Active Living Environments Index, or CAN-AL, was recently developed by Nancy Ross and colleagues at McGill University. This data set in includes postal code level measures that represent active living friendliness or walkability of Canadian communities for the years 2006 and 2016. This slide shows the favorability of active living or walkability with red showing low active living friendliness and light green showing areas of high active living friendliness. Uh, 
Another neighborhood factors data set distributed by Canoe and linked to the CLSA is nighttime light. So to build this data set, Canoe staff extracted values of annual mean nighttime brightness for all postal codes in Canada using satellite imagery from the Google Earth engine. Now let's look at air quality data. Canoe holds an, a large set of historical and current ambient air pollution exposure data at the national level for fine particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and ozone. The fine particulate matter or PM2.5 data set distributed by Canoe are publicly available data that were developed out of Dalhousie University from NASA satellite data. Annual average concentrations at a one kilometer resolution are now available through the CLSA. Green here shows a lower uh, annual average uh, PM2.5 concentrations, and orange is higher annual average concentrations of PM2.5. Annual average nitrogen dioxide estimates for all Canadian postal codes were developed by Perry Heistad using a land use regression model for 2006. And these modeled concentrations were then adjusted for subsequent years using air quality monitoring data. On this map, green is lower and red is higher annual average concentrations. And since NO2 typically indicates traffic related air pollution, we can see higher exposures along uh, traffic corridors in Victoria. Modeled annual uh, average concentrations of sulfur dioxide are also available to researchers through the CLSA. These databases were developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada using 30 kilometer satellite data. On this map, pale orange is low and darker orange is high SO2. And note that this data has a lower spatial resolution than the previous data sets, which explains the blockiness of SO2 exposure on this map. Finally, researchers interested in the effects of air pollutants on health may request a national scale model data set of monthly and annual concentrations of ozone, which is also provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada at a spatial resolution of 10 kilometers. Pale pink is lower concentrations of ozone and darker pink is higher concentrations of, of ozone on this map of Victoria. The next data theme I'll cover is greenness. So normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI is a greenness metric derived from satellite images. The lowest range of NDVI in pale color on this map indicates low or no vegetation, and the highest range, shown here in dark green, indicates dense vegetation. This data is derived at a spatial resolution of 30 meters and provided within set buffer distances of postal codes. Greenness variables linked to CLSA baseline data and available to researchers include annual average, grown season average, and maximum annual greenness values. Finally, weather and climate metrics. So pre-linked data on annual total precipitation as rain and annual total precipitation as snow from gridded surfaces based on weather station observations at postal code locations can also be accessed through the CLSA. This slide shows total annual precipitation as rain for Victoria with green showing lower precipitations and dark blue showing higher annual rainfall. We've used very narrow class breaks here to show local differences since the values range from about 1,000 to 1,100 millimeters in Victoria. Of course, uh, wider ranges will be seen over larger uh, regions. Now, I'll just mention here that full metadata documentation on each of the data sets I just presented are available on the Canoe website at canoe.ca slash data. I'll finish uh, my section of the webinar with some preliminary descriptive statistics of pre-linked data sets I just presented to give you an idea of the variation of environmental exposures within the CLSA cohort. So first of all, we see some geographic variation in, in exposures across urban and rural areas. So when comparing participants living in urban 
core to those in urban fringe and rural areas. We see higher active living friendliness or walkability in central urban areas, but we also generally see higher mean air pollution concentrations within the urban core relative to peripheral areas. This slide shows the distribution of pre-linked canoe exposure data as quintiles. Threshold for the, uh, thresholds for these quintiles are based on exposure data covering the entire country. So in other words, quintiles are defined using exposure data for all Canadian postal codes. In terms of deprivation, we see that most CLSA participants fall within the first two quintiles of material deprivation, meaning low, depri low deprivation or the most privileged quintiles. We also see that social deprivation, which is a measure of the fragility of an individual's social networks, is more equally dis distributed across quintiles for Canada. Of note, few CLSA participants live in active living friendly neighborhoods, so quintiles four and five of the walkability metric shown in the table. And lastly, many CLSA subjects live in areas of relatively high fine particulate matter concentrations and relatively low uh, NO2 and ozone concentrations. The last slide shows correlations between the different canoe area level environmental exposures that are now linked to CLSA participants. As we can see, some exposures are highly correlated. For example, we see high positive correlations between fine particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, walkability, and social deprivation, and negative correlations between greenness metrics and NO2 walkability in nighttime light. Disentangling the individual effects of interacting exposures has been a major challenge of research in environmental health and environmental epidemiology, as Jeff uh, alluded to earlier. So with the data sets I just presented, as well as new exposure data CANOE is currently developing, researchers will be able to look at the role of many environmental exposures together within a large sample of Canadians using cohorts such as the CLSA. Uh, to conclude, uh, we hope that partnerships between CANOE and the CLSA will stimulate new research, including new grant applications, on the role that environmental factors play in healthy aging. So I'll now pass it over to Eleanor, who will touch on some of the new data sets CANOE is working on, and which will also be available to researchers. Thanks, Danny. I'll just take the other slide. There we go. Hi, I'm uh, Eleanor, as uh, introduced earlier. I'm here in Victoria, BC this morning. Um, so again, thanks everyone for attending the webinar. We're really happy to be able to showcase um, some of the hard work we've been doing. Um, I just want to emphasize uh, at this point that what we're doing isn't just a one-time linkage to the CLSA. Danny's worked hard with the CLSA folks to get that great range of data um, in and pre-linked and ready to go now, but um, we do see this as an ongoing, probably annual kind of uh, event where we add updated data and add new data as time goes on as well, um, so that we can support uh, the CLSA and, and researchers through all the uh, follow-up period. Um, so far, we've been working on bringing together a lot of existing data um, that, that you've seen already. Um, some have been widely used in publication, um, and some of them have just been harder to access or need a whole lot of work uh, reformatting and summarizing before researchers can use them. Um, a good example of that are, are some of the air quality data that come out of Environment and Climate Change Canada. They're hourly, uh, they're in an odd format, and it takes a lot of work to to shape them up. So we've taken on that heavy lifting um, for the researchers. Um, at the same time, um, those six data teams that, that you've seen are, are also filling some of the gaps that we know exist, um, as well as developing new data uh, that push things forward. Um, in a lot of cases, people tend to use data because it's there, um, and we know that we can do better. So a big part of CANOE's mandate is to try and push that forward as well. So I'm going to go through a few of the data sets that we're working on now. Some of these are going to be available uh, very shortly. Some are further along uh, in our next two and a half year mandate. Um, within the next few weeks, available, we'll have available uh, new monthly and annual water balance metrics. 
So um, not just temperature related information, but rain and snow, snowpack days, um, moisture surplus and deficits, um, soil moisture and moisture indices. Um, these have been really of interest to people working on allergies, thinking about uh, fungus, mold, um, loads in the air, as well as uh, people thinking about um, just general safety. You know, is it icy days? Is it rainy days? Um, what areas potentially are having a drier season and so less vegetation out? There's quite a lot of links around the climate data here. Um, again, these are at the postal code level. What you see here is actually a screenshot of something else we're working on, our, our data browser. So right now, uh, for the canoe data, you essentially go to our website and get a description of it. Um, but in, within the next few months, we'll be launching our data browser. So you'll be able to go and work with a map, zoom in, zoom out, and look at all the different variables and see all of the uh, variation that's, that's there across Canada or in the city of interest. So that's an exciting development for us. Um, I think Danny mentioned monthly metrics for some of the air pollutants. Um, those are just coming out now again, so monthly ozone uh, and monthly nitrogen dioxide. Uh, these are potentially important for shorter term health outcomes that people may be interested in studying. Uh, we have some new neighborhood factor uh, variables coming up. Uh, access to employment is a fairly recent one. It's been uh, developed by researchers uh, using census data, and this speaks to how people choose transportation modes, where they're going throughout the day. Uh, we have the Canadian Marginalization Index, so this is similar to the Material and Social Deprivation Index uh, that we already carry, but this is a, a different view, different factors going into it. Um, it has also been widely used for research, so there's a lot of good information on what it seems to be associated with. Um, in terms of people's uh, social determinants of health. Another thing we're about to deliver is something called local climate zones. So we're interested in urban form and how it impacts people. And we've been talking about how it's many things working together. And the idea of a local climate zone sort of integrates those things. So we're mapping every postal code in terms of, is it in an urban canyon downtown with lots of high buildings and no greenery around it? Um, is it mostly an agricultural area? So it's very land use oriented, but it does integrate building height, building density, vegetation height, vegetation density all into one, um, one metric. So we're interested in seeing how that uh, relates to health um, in general. Um, one thing that we haven't done yet uh, is look at proximity metrics, although there's some good evidence for that. So for example, here's a study that's shown that um, living within 50 meters of a busy road is associated with increased dementia, even when they're um, controlling for different kinds of individual characteristics. Um, we see lots of these kinds of studies in air pollution as well. Um, very recently, uh, one of our canoe members has published a, a paper here looking at how living near water um, affects the uh, risk of mortality. And so these are really interesting, but um, as researchers, we know that these metrics are quite crude, um, just proximity. So our transportation team is uh, working hard at, at very detailed characterizations of transportation networks um, in selected cities so that we can improve the kind of uh, proximity metrics that we make for these. Um, and similarly, uh, on our work plan is to do something similar for water. Um, this study was done using a very basic exposure proxy. Um, so we're working on getting a more detailed characterization of exactly what type of water it is so we can tease out some more of, of the association that's been seen there. We talked about greenness and the satellite measure in DVI. Um, this has again been widely used partly because it's available and somewhat convenient, but uh, most of the exposure researchers and people working in this field recognize that, again, it's a relatively coarse uh, proxy for exposure to greenness. Um, and we're all working hard on trying to push this forward into more comprehensive metrics. Um, one of the things we're working on is using Google Street View. So we can look down from the satellite and say this area shows green, 
And then we can also look at the Google Street View at that location and understand exactly what we're seeing there. Um, so this is taking us into the realm of machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, you know, sort of big image scraping and big data. So um, we're excited about that. And you can see that uh, this paper is recently published um, by a canoe team, including some of our canoe staff. We think that using the Google Street View in combination with satellite is going to give us a, a lot of insight on more micro scale urban features. So um, hopefully we'll have lots to share with people. I'm certainly interested in hearing people's ideas about what they might want to pull from these images um, in terms of different metrics of interest. Uh, one of our teams is a noise team. Um, interestingly, uh, Canada doesn't really have a very good comprehensive data set of noise uh, in cities. It's uh, apparently we're well behind Europe in this in this uh, endeavor where they're very carefully mapped almost all of Europe at a very high resolution. Um, so some of our research teams are, are working diligently on this. We have a postdoc now working on field monitoring while they'll be going out and putting uh, monitors out in major cities and developing a very high resolution, uh, what we call a land use regression model for noise for all of Canada. So that'll give us uh, these postal code estimates um, of noise in various different metrics for it to add to the data set. Uh, we're probably about a year and a half, possibly two away from having that ready to go um, at this point. Um, another thing that we're working on that uh, should bear some fruit within the next year and a half are, are incorporating higher resolution satellite data than we've had easy access to before. Certainly over the last five years, I would say, um, there's been an absolute explosion of access to and tools and to use and data repositories for uh, these big satellite data. Um, sets. One of the things I think Danny mentioned was Google Earth Engine, um, where we can just go online, write scripts, um, process huge data sets that we wouldn't be able to do locally on our own computers. Um, one of these other data sets is called you know, Planet Scope Data, uh, where it's daily three meter images um, of all of Canada. Uh, so we're really interested in, in pushing these forward and trying to find new ways to pull information out of this around urban form and how it changes over time. So going forward, can we see where new developments are happening? Uh, can we go backwards in time with some of them and understand where urban form has changed and look at how that's affected people's health you know, before and after? So the idea of um, looking at intervention studies in urban form is, is really um, a big interest to canoe researchers and hopefully to others as well. Along the same lines, very shortly, we'll be able to have access to new air quality data from satellites. This is uh, a new effort, uh, one of three uh, satellites uh, going global. Uh, what this is, is a satellite that stays over Canada and the US uh, in the same position and gives us hourly air quality data at a resolution of around five kilometers. So this is a huge data stream. Um, and some of the canoe team members are, are working with NASA on this. They're part of the science team. And again, there's a postdoc getting ready to start uh, setting up the protocols for running this data through and processing it. So you can see we've got a lot of really exciting data still to come. Um, so we see this as a long-term partnership with all of the big health data cohorts and especially the CLSA. So I want to sort of sum up a little bit with just the idea that I think it's hard to really overstate how important the CANOE initiative is. Um, you can see sort of the current state of data, you know, if you're trying to put together a study with multiple factors, you know, maybe you're looking through boxes of papers in an old storage cabinet. Maybe it's on some, you know, something's on a portable drive somewhere. Who knows where it went anymore? Uh, maybe you're reading through a journal paper and hand transcribing into a spreadsheet from a table that you find. And, you know, we all know that our research associates and students graduate and go away. And sometimes the files that they worked on are not found again. And this is a real problem in research data. So 
by creating this platform and and we've had enormous support from the research community in terms of them wanting to put their data into Canoe just for these reasons. It gets documented, um, we can manage the sharing, uh, it gets archived properly. Uh, most researchers want their data to be used again. Um, and this is a way that Canoe is really helping to move the field forward, I think. Um, it also supports reproducibility in a big way. If you have done a study using one metric, and five years later, you want to go back or you want to look at another cohort, um, Canoe will have that original date available so that you're directly comparing things. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of new metrics coming all the time. How do we know which one is better? Or if it's not better, how is it different? You know, what are we picking up with the new things? So again, we need a way to be able to keep uh, the data sets alive and use them for future information. And I think that's what Canoe is doing. You can see we're providing sort of a one-stop portal where people can bring their data in and archive it and researchers can access it. And it's all managed through data sharing agreements and uh, being properly referenced and people are getting acknowledged appropriately. So that's what Canoe is. I'm gonna turn it over um, back to Jeff now, who's gonna conclude with a a few thoughts. Um, before that, I would just encourage you to go to the Canoe website. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out every few months um, with sort of the big news of what's happening in terms of webinars or new data sets. Um, you can also formally join Canoe by going to the Connect uh, menu and down to Join. Uh, there's a lot of information there on what each of our research teams are working on and the data sets themselves. So with that, I'll conclude and I'll hand it over to Jeff. Just... Okay, great. Thanks very much, Eleanor. And uh, thanks again for everybody's attention so far. I hope that you've been uh, really excited with what you've heard and seen that we're doing and how it can be used for CLSA and other environmental health research. And, uh, you know, just to summarize sort of a key aspect of what you know we feel we've done is that we really feel that we've we are increasing the capacity of the CLSA to advance research on how where an individual lives impacts their aging experience and health. So it's really about place as a very important factor and how we can sort of measure various features of, of place. A quick look through the, the approved projects ongoing within the CLSA, you know, bring up key words like sleep and physical activity, sedentary behavior, built environments, mobility, exercise, environment permanence, physical activity. Uh, these are all influenced by place, uh, as we know. Uh, and they're you know, part of Canoe and our Canoe data holdings and Canoe data improvements we're trying to make uh, and are important questions to continue to work on. So there are really good links between our interest and what we can do and some of the researchers around CLSA. But I, I think that, you know, with the platform that we've, we've established, and, and Eleanor just made a really compelling argument for, because those boxes almost look like my office if I'm vacating in Environment Canada, but uh, that we've, we really now have established a platform that, uh, you know, houses these data, that allows it to be brought in and standardized, uh, documented. Uh, and we have the opportunity now to really build the capacity to explore place-based questions over the long run. So not you know, one snapshot of let's get the best exposures we can now for this outcome over this follow-up period, but over the long run, which is, you know, something that CLSA is geared towards doing is, is a long-term follow-up, other cohorts, same thing over time. Uh, and that can be done, you know, I think best with this sort of concerted effort and platform as opposed to one study at a time. Uh, and also in, in talking about, you know, standardizing and and understanding our data, I think it allows us to better reach out internationally and look at how we are consistent with other similar efforts around the world, um, how we can harmonize exposures and information or, or understand differences better to then be, begin to think about how we can exploit contrasts between countries or you know, do various pooling exercises, whatever it might be. But having a common environmental data front like Canoe, I think can help there as well. So we are, Considering, you know, as we look at this opportunity in front of us for, for continued canoe CLSA efforts, and, and I hope that we will investigate ways that uh, we can all bring in new funding, new grants to, to maintain this relationship 
so that we can have these regular updates of metrics and new metrics. Uh, and I think that, you know, Eleanor talked about sort of data that you can collect that's available from other sources. We're also really, and I think Canoe is embracing this, we're on the, on the cusp of all sorts of new technologies that can allow people to, who are parts of health studies, to actually provide even more specialized data if you were able to have them participate, whether it be in, in small studies, small sub-studies. Of, of course, we know about uh, providing biospecimens, which can be used for various purposes. But now in the era of, care, of everybody carrying a smartphone, there, there are much more modern ways to gather information about their environmental experiences. And that's the T in the technology there that is something that's, I think, exciting to explore to really bring our cohort research to the modern age. So another area that is important is, is, is the exposed zone and asking the question about whether or not a canoe with various cohorts can really substantially advance this exposed zone concept in Canada. It hasn't really had, a, I think, a home here uh, in, in Canada at the station time. But you know, we know that a person's life course exposure leads to their, their unique phenotype, which is expressed as their exposome, uh, which is interacting, of course, with the life course with their genome to lead to you know, what we ultimately observe. And you know, we have difficult questions still to grapple with respect to their lifetime environmental conditions and then how that might influence susceptibility. Say, for example, those who are in the CLSA you know, all came with a history of, of an environmental exposure that places them in some sort of unique, uh, you know, condition right now in terms of the, the current uh, morbidities they may have uh, or susceptibilities. And unfortunately, we know, you know, very little about, you know, those people and what happened prior. Uh, Canoe was able to do some of this going back in time with residential history to 1980. Uh, and it's an opportunity that we hope to continue to explore to be able to do that for CLSA. So it's not only from recruitment forward, but a little look back in time, at least in 1980. Uh, really, you know, we come from wanting to uh, look at solutions to environmental risks. And a real challenging question that I hope we can all work on together is just how we can really learn quickly from the research and what we learn about how the urban area and urban areas and are influenced uh, our health. Um, and we're not really only urban as Canadian states, we are certainly thinking about all of Canada, but really need to turn towards solution-oriented research going forward and, and thinking about how changes in environment can lead to, to improvements in health, changes in outcome. We can look back and think about past interventions that have taken place that might be differentially affecting different populations and possibly exploit those. Uh, then that's an area of interest in Canoe is to try to start to document where there has been urban form changes that we can track and, and do that. Or also of interest might be uh, really areas of, of urban disasters, like a large flood and how the populations in those areas have been getting on since that time. But uh, in the long run, we really want to be able to optimize our urban transportation planning for healthy aging or uh, healthy you know, childhoods as well at any stage in the life course. And a big uh, elephant in the room that is a real driver for our cities and our, our plans going forward, of course, is addressing and preparing for climate change, of which I hope you've seen through some of the data we're collecting and the way we're thinking is an area where canoe and canoe data can also help address some various questions. So I really see where we're at now is a, is a really exciting point. We have lots of data together. We have good partnerships. We have pre-linked data. And I really uh, entertain any questions people might have and, and ideas to move forward so that we can really collectively go to the whole real next level of environmental health research in Canada with some, some big visions that are solution oriented. So I'll leave it there and hopefully we've, we've sparked some thoughts and ideas and questions from those online and uh, we're happy to take those in the time remaining. Thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. That was really a fabulous introduction and overview of Canoe Data. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, just a reminder, muting remains on, but you can enter your question into the chat window in the bottom right corner of the WebEx window. And I will go ahead and read it out and uh, moderate the questions to our guests. So we're waiting for a couple of questions to come in. I'll go ahead and, and ask a couple. So 
um, as I was listening to the presentation, I was thinking, how much of this environmental data do you think might just associate with socioeconomic measures? Do you think that the interactions between just socioeconomic measures of where you live and uh, how your environment interacts with that is an important concept to, to think through? Um, yeah, I don't know if we're all unmuted, but absolutely. Um, there's no question that socioeconomic factors play a big role um, directly, but um, they also interact with with place and where people live. Um, sometimes, you know, there's there's uh, areas where people can exercise more that that uh, people selectively move to who have higher socioeconomic needs. And really, if we don't have the best measure of these all together, um, we we can't start to tease apart, you know, what's really along the causal pathway uh, or how to intervene. Okay. How to fix fix some of those place problems? Yeah. Or even how to fix those? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. So, um, oh, we have a question from from Martin. Do you consider the political ge geographic environment as an important determinant of health worth mapping and studying? I yeah, I would say well, yeah, certainly. Why not? It's uh, um. It's it certainly is something that has some spatial coherence to it in some sense, um, and influences uh, within their community. Uh, you know, could influence behaviors, lifestyles. Uh, you know, it gets even right into your gene expression through various uh, mechanisms. Um, I'd be so interested to think of whether we can map that. I I know they've done it through Google Street View south of the border with. With looking at uh, a pickup truck index as an example, <laughs> or civic, <laughs> civic involvement, or uh, I yeah. yeah, I think that there are. You could certainly map out different policy arenas. Um, yeah. I know that's something that people have have tried to do, and in some cases, it's just incredibly complex. When you're down to the, you know, uh, municipal jurisdictions, there are thousands of them in Canada, and trying to develop really good policy inventories. Um, it's a real challenge. So, I mean, if people online have ideas about that, you know, we'd love to love to take that in because clearly the kinds of policies that urban planners are, are putting in place do shape the environment and uh, the social environment as well. You know, what kinds of food stores are available? You know, what kinds of, of parks are available? So it, in that terms of politics, I, I think um, city politics and, and um, policies are are certainly a key thing that we're not really capturing yet. It'd be a more colorful map than the red state blue state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure would be. Yeah. Sure would uh, be. Certainly is a um, a political, you know, in terms of you know planning planning the cities that we want. It's very very political topic. Um, you know, going through the, the elections here in Ontario lately was high in the agenda, okay. and uh, lots of I, lots of an interest to to provide some real knowledge. I have a comment from Susan Kirkland uh, to everybody and all the speakers. Canoe is an example of a highly beneficial partnership. Your leadership in environmental health and linkage cohorts is greatly appreciated. So I think that can be echoed by us all here at yeah. CLSA and across, across Canada. Yes, thank you, Susan. Um, so uh, on online, we also have um, some people from our statistical analysis center. We have our data access officer, Ishvan molnar Salkatch available to answer questions if we have any specific issues about data access through the CLSA. I'll go ahead and ask, ask a question about that. Um, so throughout the webinar, you, you discussed the postal code as being a six-digit six, uh, postal code. So with CLSA data, would we need the six-digit postal code to be able to uh, utilize the, the data, or could you roll that up to a higher amount and still have meaningful associations at the dissemin dissemination level or even the, the city or provincial area level? Um, I'll, I'll start with that one, it's Eleanor. Um, it, some of the data for sure are already at a fairly coarse resolution. So, you know, in that regard, you could aggregate, but I do think uh, there's real value in using the appropriate resolution data for what you're trying to study. So yes, we could aggregate some of our lower resolution data up to dissemination areas. 
Um, and, you know, that might be useful if you think there's a regional component to what you're interested in as opposed to a very local one. So if you think that, you know, the greenness on my street is important to your health outcome, you might want to use the better resolution data. But if you think, well, it's actually the greenness in my neighborhood I'm interested in more around walkability. So I think, you know, greenness within a kilometer or two is more important than you could aggregate up. Um, but you would still need to have some connection to your person's health data. So how you connect it to individual X would still be through that postal code. You would just use a aggregated exposure metric for the area around the postal code. I hope that's helpful. Sure. Yeah, and, and maybe just to, to add on that. So what we did since the six digit postal code has some privacy implications. So the CLSA can't distribute six digit postal code uh, with any health data to, to researchers. So what we did is Canoe has sent data sets with the six digit postal code as the first column and exposures as subsequent columns to the CLSA uh, data curator who then link the data sets within the secure environment and and the, these are the data sets stripped of six digit postal codes that are being uh, distributed to researchers thank you that's a that's a good good discussion of the point so we have a comment from uh, marielle benacker from europe and uh hopefully we have addressed that issue about the privacy making link more challenging so thank you danny for that well, um, we'll wait for a couple of more questions to come through, but I'll go ahead and thank you again for being here and being a part of our uh, webinar series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is February 25th, uh, 2019. Please visit our website under data access to review available data, further information, and details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their survey located under the polling option. If you have any questions or concerns that we can help you with, you can write it in the chat box right now and we can uh, help. Uh, continue to um, ask questions in the chat box and uh, we at the CLSA uh, will try to answer them as we can. And um, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. We invite you to follow us on Twitter. So thank you again to our Canoe team and our presenters for being here today. Thank you. Finally, we'll have our next monthly webinar in November on moving more to breathe better, associations between physical activity, sitting time, and lung function in the CLSA. It's presented by Dr. Shipla Dabra. So go to our CLSA website to register for the webinar series soon and join us for all of our monthly webinars. And thank you again for attending today's presentation.